Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to The Upside. I'm Jonathan Oleski with JMOR, and our show is about to begin. It's my pleasure to introduce our two outstanding hosts today, Beth Goldsmith, Chair of the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore, and Dr. Scott Rifkin, publisher of JMOR. Beth and Scott, take it away. Thanks, Jonathan, and welcome again to The Upside. This is our virtual show brought to you by the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore and JMOR Magazine to keep you informed about everything going on in our community. We're really interested in keeping the Jewish community informed because the times are so uncertain. Today, we're gonna to be talking with Barack Herman, Chief Executive Officer of the JCC. In the past month, in accordance with Maryland's reopening plan, the JCC has been working to provide safe, socially distanced programming at its Rosenblum Owings Mills campus. From fitness to swimming to camp, the JCC is complementing its robust virtual offerings to ensure members have multiple ways to stay engaged. At the same time, the recent pandemic has provided the JCC with the opportunity to actually reinvent itself. Welcome Barack and Scott, please introduce mm -hmm. our guest. But it's a great pleasure to do this. Um, I grew up at the JCC. I didn't have summer camp. I didn't have, uh, you know, I grew up in, on, on the poor side of town. So the JCC was summer camp for me. And the years we could afford it, I went in the front door. And the years I couldn't afford it, somebody would open the side door for me and let me in the gym. So it was, it was really a, a wonderful experience all these years, enjoying the JCC, both on Park Heights Avenue and, and in Owings Mills. And my father was a lifeguard at the original J way back when, you know, in years and years before that even. So we're, it's a real pleasure to have Barack Herman join us, comes to us out of, uh, let's see, New Jersey, where you were running the JCC in central New Jersey, and you've been with us since 2012. So thank you for being here today. Well, thanks, Scott. Thanks, Beth, Jonathan. It's, a, it's an honor to see all of you, and thank you for the leadership that you guys have been providing before and during these times um, to really keep us informed. But I'm honored to be with you. And as Scott, you know, I do have a set of keys and scanning yes. passes. So if you want to come through the back door, the front door, the loading dock, I can totally hook you up. So you just let me know. <laughs> Lots of great memories. Thursday night basketball leagues and the, the Vince who worked at the Tal uh, station for 40 years and just neat, neat memories out of, out of the JCC. It's been a real pleasure yeah. that that's been part of our lives in Baltimore for all these years. So thank you. Thanks. You know, it's, um, you know, it's what's really amazing about this JCC is that I can go to so many places and people will say to me, oh, my uncle worked at the J. My grandmother worked at the J. Um, you know, and we're, I say it often, you know, I'm really proud of our community. Um, we're the oldest JCCs in North America and, you know, formed in 1854 and 166 years old. So we've responded to a lot of stuff over the last 160 plus years. And there's a long history with this community and our JCCs. So um, I'm not surprised that, Scott, you have employment blood in your history at the J. And, uh, and I just thank you. And I know Beth has a fondness for this organization a long time. And I'm sure everybody's got a Jay story. Everybody's got a Jay story. So I'm, I'm honored to be on with you guys. Well, thank well, you. Well, let's jump in, Barack, and get you started on talking even more about how proud you are. Tell us how things have been going with the reopening. So, you know, it's been incredible. Um, it's been a whirlwind. It just really has been. I mean, the first thing I have to do is a shout out to the JCC staff, the board of directors, and the associated for really teaming up and really right from the beginning, recognizing what's happening in our community and what's happening at our J. So, you know, once, once Governor Hogan allowed us to reopen, um, we have been very, very disciplined and very thoughtful. Um, I, I have a mantra, you know, that I say, we don't get points for going first, we get points for getting it right. And just because the governor said you can open up tomorrow doesn't mean you need to open up tomorrow. You only open up when you can guarantee that it's safe for your members, your staff, and our community. And we have um, made sure that every protocol, every procedure, equipment has been in place um, to make sure that people can feel as comfortable as we can make them if they choose to take advantage of our opening. 
Um, so it's going well. Um, we started up outside, as many of you know. We're still now offering outside and inside um, exercising. Um, we've opened up camp last week. We're in week two of camp. Um, we have uh, 260 children in camp. Um, we're doing a lot of virtual stuff. Um, but so far, the response by the membership has been fantastic. I think that overall, people feel very safe and very comfortable with our procedures. And a big shout out to uh, LifeBridge Health, because as our medical partner, they have really been in, in the foxhole with us on speed dial and on texting to really make sure that every procedure we have is defensible and thoughtful and leveraging you know, the, the best thinkers in Baltimore. So we feel good about reopening so far, Beth. Great. Very good. How about the main gym and the track, indoor track? Are they open yet or they're not, not yet? Okay, so the main gyms are not open right now. We have not yet approved basketball play because of the proximity that the players have towards each other. Um, the camps are definitely, the gyms are being used for summer camp in a very social distance, thoughtful way. But the indoor fitness center in Owens Mills is open. It's all reservation appointments. No more than 50 people um, working out at one time. And we usually average between 20 to 30 people. So we still have capacity. And you're talking about 50 people, Scott, in a 10,000 square foot fitness center. So we've taken out a lot of equipment. Everybody's socially distanced, but for the members that are working out, they're feeling really great about it. Good, good, good. You know, exercise is a great mental, uh, you know, psychological uh, support. And for those of people who really enjoy exercise to not be able to have that, that ability to go into the gym and do those things during this last few months has been a real problem. So have you, have you dealt much with that? Have you dealt with people that are just not understanding of the issues and really are desperate to get back in? Um, I think people are very thoughtful and understanding of the, 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 um, the seriousness of these times. I think for some people, you know, we all, you know, some people a little bit, you know, thinking we're too strict about the mask wearing inside the building or some of the, some of the protocols. But I think for people that want to work out, they're feeling comfortable coming here. But we also have a really robust um, online platform. Because we know that for people exercising, especially back in March and April, when the weather wasn't good, our virtual lineup was really strong. Um, our, probably our number one thing right now, Scott, that is causing us probably the most stress and the most usage is lap swimming. Because a lot of people can go outside right now and walk and run and get active. But swimming and lap swimming is different. So right now, all of our lap lanes are pretty much uh, filled every minute of every day. And we're lucky to have the beautiful Shapiro Aquatics Park in Owings Mills. Um, but overall, I think people are, are tolerating us um, and our rules. Some people might think we're um, a little too strict, but we believe that, that we have to err on that caution and follow every protocol, um, even to the farthest degree. Very good. Beth? Yeah, um, Barack, tell us more about the virtual offerings. I know you've been doing this since you were first shut down, and I know it's part of the plan to continue to do them even as things reopen. So tell us some of the great things we can access virtually. Yeah, so that's awesome. So one thing that most Jays don't have in North America is a Gordon Center for Performing Arts. And quickly, our um, community uh, and our professional team and our lay viewers were able to convert the Gordon Center into a really a live streaming performing arts, um, uh, almost like a TV studio. The staff joked and said, you said you wanted a TV studio, we gave you a TV studio. So the Gordon is really impressive. So we live stream classes um, of our instructors that felt comfortable to come in and teach. So um, a lot of that virtual content's available. We offer live uh, live streaming classes virtually. We do classes also on Facebook Live. Um, just on Sunday from two to six, our Center for Arts and Culture had a, we live streamed a, a bluegrass festival called I think, Summer of, I think Summer of Love. It was featuring local Baltimore musicians and bands and artists. We live streamed them from the Gordon Center. It was awesome trying to support local artists and give them an opportunity to perform. So we're live streaming music. 
um, we're live streaming um, classes. We're also doing a lot of um, virtual film. If you check out our website, one of the big things that would have been very upsetting to us is that I think it was the 36th annual William and Irene Weinberg Family Jewish Film Festival in April and May, and we couldn't do it, but our team learned how to turn our film festival into a virtual one. You should now our team, um, not surprising in Baltimore, is being asked to consult with other Jewish communities about how to make their film festival virtual, um, Baltimore leading the way. But we found that we could sell subscriptions to people living in Florida, Boston. So you don't have to even live in Baltimore right now to experience our virtual content. You could be a Baltimorean living somewhere else right now and experience. So we have um, virtual fitness, virtual arts and culture, um, film, book authors, Daniel Silva speaking this week um, through our programming. We're partnering with other Jays. So Beth, if people check out our website, www.jcc.org backslash virtual, they'll see a lot of virtual content being put out both in fitness and especially in arts and culture. I think there's a great way to give people something to look forward to every day if it's a great author or a film or a concert. So cool stuff is happening. So the Daniel Silva, I've heard him speak before. He's a great speaker. And for those that don't know him, he is the gentleman that writes the um, a group of uh, uh, spy books. Uh, the, the main character is, give me a second, is, um, I'll think of the name of the main character, but it's a long series of very best-selling books. And he's a, he's a great writer to hear. But the entrepreneurial side of me says, Barack, you might have the national Jewish uh, film festival. You just need to rename it. Think about it a second. <laughs> we, I'm sure Beth, if Beth can help us figure out a naming opportunity, we'll, we'll make that happen, right Beth? We'll be the National Baltimore Jewish Film Festival. We got the Weinberg family. We'll do whatever we got to do. Yeah, but big sponsorship really, opportunities there. I'm liking it. Yeah, I will tell you, it's really, really um, exciting because thinking entrepreneurially at this time was really critical for us. And I love that word because you know, this is not a time for conventional thinking. This is a time for creative thinking. And we can all be negative and doom and gloom, but we can also look at how, to, how can we still connect with people and how can we engage. And arts and culture is a great way if it's books or film. And Scott, you should also know we're partnering with Atlanta and lots of other Jewish communities that are really know, know the quality of our team to partner with. So there's national film festivals and there's also opportunities to really partner with other communities to bring really robust content and share costs. That's so great. So the, that. the author's uh, to, uh, character is Gabrielle Alon. If, if, Gabrielle if Alon. And his wife is, is Jamie Gangel, the national reporter for one of the big networks. So he has really interesting perspectives on international politics that's fascinating. He's a great one for people to listen to. So jumping back awesome. to that, I'll right back. Yes, yeah, Scott, Scott, I was going to say, remind me never to play Trivial Pursuit with you. <laughs> I, 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 th I think you might mop up the floor with me. But Barack, uh, let's talk about some of the, more, some of the other um, really sort of pivoting uh, aspects of what the JCC is up to. I know that you have decided to close the downtown JCC, and I know you're re-envisioning what family engagement will look like. Talk to us a little about that. Yeah, I think that, you know, we felt, and I felt strongly with leadership that we had to treat the JCC like we're in startup mode. Um, you know, we have an incredible support from our associated, um, over 25% of our operating budget, but we also have to generate the other 75% of who we are and to use this time to be really thoughtful and creative. So unfortunately, we did close the DBJCC, which is heartbreaking. It's a, a favorite project of mine um, and many people within our leadership. But the goal, the goal of the DBJCC was to connect with young Jewish families that live downtown and to provide them meaningful experiences to find their people and find their Jewish community. Um, so without the DBJCC, we could still do that work. We can still provide meaningful Jewish experiences and help people find their friends, and, and especially when they're young families. So we have redefined our entire department to be called J Around Town, Jewish Family Engagement. Um, we went from having, I think, about six and a half full-time employees down to three and a half. But those three and a half people are going to be 
leveraging partners and other locations to bring meaningful Jewish programs to emerging Jewish neighborhoods that were identified in our recently completed 2020 study. So it could be bookstores, it could be the Enoch Pratt libraries. We have a historical relationship for years of bringing these types of fun mommy and me, hands-on holidays, programming, um, and we're going to continue to do that even more robust. We have a pretty um, meaningful relationship with the Ys of Maryland. We started doing programs at the Towson Y, meaning wherever there are Jewish families moving into neighborhoods, we're going to look for um, creative partners to continue to bring the programming. A lot of the programming we did this past year, Beth, was also in Hunt Valley at Foundry Row. And we're going to have to monitor if those are the right locations to be at this time. Um, but we're still looking to partner um, to bring this. We have a new full-time director of Jewish Family Engagement. Her name is Ellie Batkan. We have a J Around Town program coordinator, Rachel Cohn, all under the leadership of Sharon Siegel, who's been with us for 30 years doing outreach. So I can just assure you that the community is going to see the same level of programming and cool stuff happening. It's just not going to be at a, a certain one-stop destination. It's going to be at multiple partners all around town. But it was very much a priority for our leadership and the associated that we continue to do this work at this time, but just reimagine it and be creative about how we can deliver it. So you, you mentioned something that, that sounded painful. And I, I watched your face when you said it, which is you had to let a couple of people go in a department. Talk about the impact from a business perspective on the entire JCC operation. And I know that's not, you know, look, what we want to promote is all the great things. I know, I stretch out for these. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think it is something that, that the community is interested in. And certainly the yeah. folks that are philanthropic in the community pay attention to. Tell us about the business impact on the organization. So, um, first of all, I'm glad that, I, you know, I always say when you have to really separate from employees, it's got to hurt. And once it stops hurting, then um, I want someone to maybe uh, give me a wake up call. So even my reaction is still, it's still very raw. Um, the JCC is a $20 million agency or a metropolitan agency. Um, and our revenues completely stopped at the end of March. You know, we stopped preschool, we had summer camp, but the incredible Baltimore community um, through April, May, and June, 85% of members kept their membership going, which was incredible. Um, one of the highest in the country. I would say right now we're about 68, 70%, but I just heard that we sold a bunch of new memberships for people wanting to swim at the pool club last weekend. So we're hovering around 68, 70%, which four months into this pandemic, Scott, is still a statement that 70% of, of the membership is using the J, paying for the J, when under 20% are actually utilizing it. So what happened on a business perspective is that overnight our revenues um, were projected to be cut almost by 35 to 40%. Um, we took this as a very long-term business approach that we had to make some really tough decisions. So we unfortunately, um, I think it's been you know, documented here on Jaymore and other places that we, we, back in March, instituted a furlough of employees that was north of 350 people. We kept uh, a management team of 44 people to help manage through the pandemic. Um, right now, payroll is back up to about 130, 140 people because of summer camp and group exercise instructors and lifeguards. So we're slowly bringing people back as phases of the um, government mandated openings allow us to reopen. But we did um, have to also really look at every department of the J and decide how we can do things leaner, more thoughtfully and fiscally responsibly. So every department of the J has been restructured. And, every, and we did have to not just institute layoffs, but do some separations from employees. And some of them were decade long employees that was very, very painful to end service to this JCC for 20, 30 years in such an, a way. But we had to take a very long-term approach to what's um, going to sustain this institution. So it's been painful on the employee side, um, but at the same time, I'm really grateful for our community for the way we handled it, the way we took care of people, really uh, made sure that they were set up and taking advantage of the CARES package and the unemployment 
and also, again, in partnership with the Associated, providing um, medical coverage for an extended period of time was a real statement of our community to not just um, take people off medical. I mean, I'm talking three, four months of medical. This was an incredible statement of our community about Rahmanis and taking care of people. So it's been challenging like no other industry. Um, last year at this time, we had almost 900 people on payroll, and right now we're at about 130 people. So it's a reality of, of, of the business environment that we're in, even as a nonprofit. So I saw that pain in your face when you first mentioned it. So folks who haven't run businesses and are in the, seeing what's going on don't always understand the pain that's involved when you take these folks that you deal with every day and you know about their children and their wives and their husbands and their, 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 all their family issues. And now you're telling them you don't have a job for them. And it's, it's really incredible, difficult, incredibly difficult. How did you handle that? Um, I think I try to, you know, be consistent. I, I think I believe in being transparent with employees about exactly what's happening and why. Um, I think that we need to be guided by values of compassion and empathy um, and, and just doing the right thing for the institution. I think personally, it's, it's rough at times, Scott, um, to do this work. I've been doing uh, JCC um, you know, executive work for almost 16 years, so I've been on this merry-go-round before. But when anybody says, oh, I've been there, sorry, none of us have been there at this time. Yeah. I've done enough restructuring of organizations. I've done enough reductions in force. This is unprecedented to have to put, you know, 350 people on a Zoom call. But I think that I, um, I trust my gut in talking to people and being honest. I don't try to mince the words at this time. If there's one silver lining of this time, it's, it's not over preparing, just trusting your heart and trusting your gut and talking to people very honestly and most of the time, they almost like want to jump through the Zoom. I feel like can give me a hug. Like they want to know if I'm okay because they say it's not your fault. It's not your fault. But the last thing I'd want to do to someone who works so hard for this institution for not, you know, great compensation, they do it because they want to serve communities, tell them that it abruptly ends. So how do I get through it? You know, try to take care of myself, eat well, <laughs> and try to see, look for silver linings. I think people that know me well know that I try to be an optimistic person and, and try to always keep cup, the cup half full. So, and look, and look to, to make sure that we're positioning ourselves, you know, for the future. Thank you, Barat. Thank you for sharing that personal piece of this. And Scott, thank you for asking, because it really is a different story than just owning your own business when it is a communal business. And it's a business that even though you do bring in lots of money, also communal dollars go towards this. So it's very important to discuss how responsible you have had to be and are continuing to be with those communal dollars. And I think it's also important for the community to understand how desperately we need their dollars and their help uh, in, in continuing to have all this happen. So there's my, there's my association. No, Beth, I knew you'd sure. get there, it was great. Right, well, but I do appreciate that we've had that discussion and I'm gonna just turn things a little bit, Barack, you sort of skipped over it quickly, but we did mention preschool. And I'm wondering what the plan, the thoughts, what can we expect in the fall, preschool and any other fall activities? I am really excited to talk about that because as much as we're in camp mode right now and trying to operate, we are, um, we, we are thinking out six weeks about what this is gonna look like. And actually that's where I'm spending my afternoon today with our really incredible dedicated senior directors of early childhood thinking about this. It is our intention to open up in the fall, both the Stoller Early Childhood Center in Owens Mills and the Meyerhoff School in Park Heights. Um, we have a lot of need from our families to get back to work. They need childcare, people trust us. We're learning a lot this summer about dealing with a lot of things. So um, what it might look like though, and it's a little premature because we haven't spoken to the families yet, we are looking at the hours of the day um, because just because we want to open doesn't mean we have enough teachers who are willing to work. And that's another thing that we have to recognize as a result of this pandemic is, oh, the government says you're open, open up your school. A lot of people are like, wait a minute, I have my own issues. I have, I'm immune compromised. 
So just because people want us to open up, we have to make sure that we can safely staff the school, clean the school, have enough housekeepers, maintenance. So um, the long answer there about this, we are planning to open up both schools uh, for infant care, trying to determine we're very blessed to have two sites, how we might position each site differently to meet the needs of the community. Um, we have great leadership in place and our plan is to end up open up at the end of August. And um, we're planning on sending out an announcement to the families by the end of this week of what our intentions are. Right now, we are looking at the hours of the day. We're not sure we can go from seven in the morning to six o'clock because that means two staff shifts versus potentially limiting the hours so we have more consistent staff. Because one of the issues with this whole pandemic is who's coming in and out of your space. So if you have a lot of teachers on sick one day and you're bringing in subs, you can imagine the number of protocols. So we are um, um, reopening our preschools. We are fully in intention to do that. It's going to be very interesting from a medical perspective, and that's my background, to see what happens when daycares and elementary schools and high schools open. While it is true that there is less severe illness in younger groups, it's not necessarily true that they don't carry it and spread it. And if anybody's ever seen a kindergarten class, Barack, as you have, there is no way to socially <laughs> distance five-year-olds and four-year-olds. And, and they are, you know, a great disease vectors back to their families. So it is going to be really interesting to see what happens and what's going to happen with that. So your, your caution and care is, is appreciated. It's, it's not an easy, it's not going to be an easy situation. And we may learn some lessons, good and bad, as this, as this occurs. Yeah, and look, we're doing it this summer. We, I was really impressed. We have 71, 71 children in Noah's Ark, our early childhood program this summer. We just did not do infants and toddlers this summer. The program is only two to four-year-olds. I think we're really got a lot of the stuff we're thinking about today and tomorrow is about infants and toddlers also coming in. But yeah, everything will be done in the strictest safest way or um, they won't, we won't compromise anything to uh, just to you know, make sure we run it safely. Now, you might want to talk to the folks at LifeBridge because it would be fascinating to see if there is any impact on family levels of disease in those children that are in, the, in Noah's Ark. That would really give you a clue for what might happen in the fall. So it might be interesting yeah. to talk to one of their epidemiologists about that. That would be an interesting, quick, down and dirty sort of study medically. Without a doubt, without a doubt. And look, we have to watch lots of things. You know, what's interesting about running these programs is that the kids can be fine, the families can be fine. It's about who sometimes people hang out with on the weekends mm -hmm. that also causes us some, some stress. So we're also encouraging our staff and our families to just to be really thoughtful that you know, on the weekends, just because the beach is open and Hershey Park is open, just to choose where you're being very thoughtfully and wear your masks and stay, you know, and do all those things because it's also the other things outside the community that can affect the community. So we just have to be really on top of a lot of things here. Absolutely. Uh, Since you're, I'm sorry, what, but I wanted to ask following up on you talking about young people, we do have something special, or you do, the teen engagement programs that the JCC runs Forefront. Tell us how that is working, being reinvented, reimagined. Sure. We're very lucky to have Rabbi Dina Schaefer, the exec of Forefront, another um, staple signature program only made possible because of the associated. And we have one of the most robust teen le leadership platforms in the country under um, the JCC management. Forefront is a community teen initiative of teen leadership that the associated funds in partnership with other major foundations, and we're lucky to be the, the holder of it. Um, the team right now is really looking at reimagining all its signature programs. It's hard to ask teenagers right now to commit to a year long program. Programs like Diller, are still planning to have a trip to Israel next summer. So we're still running our Diller program. We're still running different programs, but uh, Rabbi Dina under her leadership and feedback from staff and families are looking at offering um, a new lineup of programs that are gonna be presented at the end of August that will be shorter, like a semester long, like a trimester long, like eight or 10 weeks 
because it's hard right now for parents to spend that kind of money to commit to a, you know, a 12 month program with so much uncertainty and, you know, the uncertainty about doing trips. You know, a lot of our programs have trips to Annapolis, trips to New York, trips to Israel. And with the uncertainty, we also need to think about how we charge for those programs. So we have decided to reimagine all of the programs except for Diller. Um, Diller staying as it was. So if anybody knows anybody interested in our amazing Diller program, please apply. But uh, we're reimagining everything to um, really meet the needs of today. Um, it, it would be really um, remiss on my part if I didn't talk just for a moment about the other issues facing our society today, if it's per pervasive uh, racism, the mental health issues for teens. So Dina, under her leadership, feels very strongly that as much as we need to have these signature leadership programs, we also need to meet the needs of what the teens need from us now. And there's, you know, they need a lot of support in dealing with the, the racist issues that are happening and how to respond and speak to friends. Um, as a Jew, how do we handle that? Um, and at the same time, we're also very aware of the mental health issues facing our adolescent community during this time. So you'll be seeing a lot of stuff that we're looking at doing in that area too. So just not the stuff we've done, but reimagining really how we serve teens during this, this time. Very good. So maybe you could take a minute and tell folks, Liz, we, you know, it's interesting. This, this show, this broadcast is going to be on YouTube and Facebook, and we typically get a couple of thousand views, which is nice. Why don't you tell the folks listening how they find out about all the things going on at the JCC? you know, how they access that information. And even folks who haven't been members and are hearing about these virtual services, that may really appeal to even new members. So I'm gonna do that, but I'll do one little plug. You know, um, you know, the JCC today is part of our strategic plan from a couple of years ago is really broken into three areas. And based on those three areas, a center for youth and families, a center for sports and wellness, and a center for arts and culture, we can really provide a real wealth of, of, of programs and services and connection um, for people. And all of that can be found on our website at www.jcc.org backslash a virtual, or just go on our website and see the entire platform. Because in our Center for Children and Families, we have preschools, we have summer camps, we have teen programs, we have J Kids programs, we have our J Around Town, which we talked about earlier. In our Center for Sports and Wellness, we have aquatics. Um, today, uh, we're starting our swim team up again this summer. Um, I just should mention that because that's just starting uh, now. We have aquatic services, virtual fitness services, on-site fitness. And then in our Center for Arts and Culture, we have film and books and live music and really cool stuff. So um, it's all there for you. But there's one little thing that I'll give you a little um, taste of, too, that I'm really excited is we are near completion, about 98 percent. We are going to be opening up a drive-in movie theater at the Gordon Center for the Performing Arts. We will be the only drive-in in Baltimore County. Um, we are using our beautiful landscaped Owens Mills property under the leadership of John Mayers, who's on our board of directors, and Sarah Shalva, our chief arts officer, and Peter Michelson, our theater director. Uh, back in April, May, we saw that drive-ins were coming back and Midwest, and we thought about kids having summer experiences during this pandemic of having ice cream at the J and watching a drive-in, but we're not gonna do what lots of people are doing and put up a blow-up screen it's the JCC, it's Baltimore, it's the Associated. We don't do anything like that. We are literally constructing a movie theater um, with, with engineers on the side of the JCC building. We are taking down some trees. We are opening up sight lines. We are setting up an antenna for a separate FM um, radio station. And this is, someone said to me, why are you spending all this time and money just for this summer? I said, what do you mean just for this summer? This is going to be part of our our programming for years. We could do films in October and November. We can have film festival nights in the parking lot. And next summer, we can have a summer season. And Beth, you'll love this. It's a great sponsorship opportunity, right? So I just want to let you know that we're also starting a drive-in movie theater. We hope to be launched the first week of August with 14 movie dates um, before the Jewish holidays. So there's a lot of cool stuff that we're trying to also look at that we can also really 
continue to bring the Jewish community together. And how great would it be to have 160, 180 cars at the JCC at night, people watching a movie and, and, and getting to see each other a bit, especially during these crazy times. So, so you need to, thanks for letting you me do a plug. No, no, no. So you need to go to the car dealers and, 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 and at least one of the prominent families has been a big sponsor of yours and explain to them how many convertibles they can sell in the parking lot. Have them bring convertibles out for sale. This is, this is a serious sponsorship opportunity. I, I, think, I think, Scott, I'm putting you on the JCC sponsorship committee. <laughs> you know, but that's a great idea. But we do feel, you should know, Bank of America just made a very um, sizable sponsorship for this program. So we're starting to collect sponsors for this because we can also show commercials before the movies come on. So it's going to be a thing because that's what we do in JCC in Baltimore. We make everything be a thing. So uh, it's, it's not just going to be a blow up screen. I'll tell you that much. That sounds fun. That really sounds fun. Beth, do you have any other questions? Um, no, I just want to make sure that everybody heard the way to get in touch with you and to learn all about this. So I'm just going to repeat. If you want to learn more about the JCC summer programs, swimming, the new teen programs, and what's happening at the Gordon Center, you can just go to jcc.org. Look at the whole site. If you want virtual programs, do a slash virtual when you do that. I think I covered all of that. And uh, Barack, You're is welcome. there anything else you want to tell us about? I love that you do big things. I always, you know me, nobody likes a big party more than I do. So uh, anything else you want to yeah. share that we didn't get to? No, just let's, let's, let's continue to support each other as a community. Let's continue to, you know, um, support the associated keep your membership at the J going and all of us doing our part and to really support our neighbors and support our neighborhoods. And we'll get through this and this too shall pass. It's just going to take a lot longer than we might've planned, but no one should think for a moment um, that the, the JCC won't be here and the associated and our synagogues and our, our Jewish community and our neighborhoods. So I'm just grateful to have any opportunity, as you know, Beth, to, to talk about our community and the JCC. And I, you know, have me back if you, if you want. So <laughs> I'm happy to talk and, and really, I'm, I'm, I just think we have a beautiful community and we just need to su continue to support each other. And, and we will certainly have you back. Barack, thank you so much for taking the time with us today on behalf of Jay Moore and the Associated. Thank you. And Beth, you have some closing announcements. I just wanna also add my thanks, Barack. It's always great to have a conversation with you and to see you, even if it's only little you. <laughs> and I just if want to- you put to... me on speaker view, I'm bigger. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I'm on an iPhone, so no one's too big, <laughs> including me. <laughs> but um, So anyway, to our, again, thanks for being here. To our audience, continue to visit associated.org and jmoreliving.com for more information, stories, and resources. You can also sign up for the weekly newsletter. And we will be back next week, Tuesday, July 21st at noon. All right, thank you everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, Barack. Thanks so much for including me. Have a good one, everybody.